Hi, this is Elisa Wynn. I'm on the team here at Second Students West, and I wanted to welcome you to our podcast today. If you want to follow along with what our ministry is doing, check us out on Facebook or Instagram at Second Students West. I hope what you hear today pushes, stretches, and inspires you in your walk. Enjoy the podcast. We said we are continuing in our series called Check Yourself. Our scripture for the entire series comes from Proverbs 4.23. It says, above all, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And so the entire month, we've been looking at checking ourselves for idolatry, checking ourselves for anger, and for fear. Because if you were going to ask yourself, what is the point of this life? What are we supposed to do right here, right now? I, I think we would get a lot of different answers, right? Maybe we can get some answers like our point of being here right now is to live life to the fullest and have fun and that's it. Okay. Or another um, objective one might say is work hard, uh, grow a family, provide your family, and that's it. All right, that's fair. But as Christians, as believers, for people like you and I, our main goal, our objective should be to love God, love people, and fulfill the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is, simply put, spreading the gospel by making disciples who make disciples, making followers of Christ who make followers of Christ. But we can't do those things if we, char- we, if we aren't checking our hearts for anger, for idolatry, for fear. Because if we have idols, if we have things put into places where only God should be, we're not going to love God well. If we haven't turned ourselves for anger, we can't love people correctly because we don't want to love them. We don't want to um, love the way that we should because of our hatred, because of our, our broken heart. And if there's fear in our hearts, we won't want to share the gospel with people because we're afraid of what they might think about us. So to add to that list of idolatry, anger, and fear, we're going to talk about pride. And I was thinking about pride, and I was also thinking about the opposite of that, which is humility, and what, what humbles us, and what makes us humble. And um, I, I don't know if you know this, but I, I lead worship at live. I sing, I play guitar, sometimes play piano. But a lot of those times, I, uh, I've actually have caught myself messing up on stage, live, in front of you guys, plenty of times. And so I don't know if you've ever heard of Worship Fails, which is um, this profile on Instagram where <laughs> it's, just, it's just like a, a whole profile of people messing up during worship services and all that. I was going to show you guys some of that, but I figured, why, why share strangers when you can share videos of yourself messing up in front of people? So I have a couple videos I wanted to show you of my own Worship Fails. I think we have one, um, the first one, which is Jesus this one. Is calling. Have you come to so this is Oh Come to the Altar. We start the song in Jesus one key. And then somehow well, the song transitions to its Jesus second key. And you can see my confusion in a little bit. Oh, come to the altar. There you go. And I'm telling the band to time out because we're not doing a good job right now. Everyone cuts out except the drums. But we got back on. That's all that matters. Am I right? Am I right? Was that weird for you guys? Was that awkward? Good. We're going to do some more. All right, we've got a second video. Here we go. I think this is voice cracks. Time. Oh, God. Cool. And I think we have one more. This is the most recent one from this past week. If you were there, you know what happens, but let's just let's just watch it. Oh. Okay, here we go. Uh, can I I got off and I couldn't get back on. And here's the instrumental. My friend tried to do me good by cutting off the lights 
and making me sit in the dark. It worked out kind of well. All right, and we got back on. We got back on. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I didn't do a hot job. But, guys, I thought of that because oftentimes when I'm in my own life, whenever I feel like I'm doing a good job, I tend to forget the main thing, which is to honor and glorify God and to love him. But there are times in my own life when my pride comes in and I start to think, all right, well, I'm doing a, I'm doing a pretty good job right now. I don't, I don't think I need to, I'm not thinking this directly, but I think I'm subconsciously thinking it. I'm like, I don't need to glorify God as much. I mean, I feel pretty great doing this. And then God finds a way to bring us down to humble us. The definition of pride, I looked it up, is this. It's a group of lines. Nah, just kidding. It's not. Grammar joke. A pride is this. A feeling of deep satisfaction derived from one's own achievements. Deep satisfaction derived from one's own achievements. If there was one person that I can think of in the Bible that had the issue of pride, I would go to King Nebuchadnezzar. And the passage we're going to read from is Daniel 4, verses 29 through 34. If you have your Bible, go to it. If you have eyeballs, you can look at the screen. But before we go there, I want to give you some context for what's happening in Daniel. So throughout all of ancient Israel's history, Israel is either conquering a group of people or they're being conquered for the most part, right? And at this point in the book of Daniel, Israel is conquered. It is conquered by this empire, by this kingdom called the Babylonians. And Daniel, as a kid from Israel, grew up and was brought up into Babylonian culture. He grew up to be um, what, what they would say an, an interpreter, right, of dreams. And right before we reach Daniel 4, 29, verses 34, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and Daniel interprets it. Any of y'all have, like, really weird dreams, or do you ever sleep talk, or do you ever sleepwalk in your dreams? Anybody? I had this really weird experience. This is not really relating to the story, but I'm going to talk about it anyways. I had this weird experience where I was falling asleep, but I knew, like, I was aware of what was happening. I was in bed. I knew that. But I was also dreaming. I, I don't know why, but I was dreaming of some lady giving me a plate of food. Um, and she only gave me half a plate of food, and I was so angry. So in my dream, but then I also realized in real life, I said, you know what's really weird? She didn't give me a whole, whole plate of food. And I, the moment I said that, I realized I was still sitting in bed, and Elisa was like, what? And I was like, you know what's really weird? I knew I was dreaming, but I, I knew I was, yeah, it's whatever. Okay. Weird. Dreams, am I right? Okay. Yeah, something like that, probably. Anyways, dreams. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and the dream was this, that there was a big tree. It was big. It was tall. It was healthy. It had leaves. It had fruit. But the tree would be cut down. No matter how big, no matter how healthy, it was cut down. And Daniel comes to interpret it, and he says, look, Nebuchadnezzar, this is, this is what the interpretation of the dream is. You are the tree. You're, you're growing a huge empire. You're doing a great job, but you're going to be cut down. And so this passage we're about to read is right after that. Verse 29. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Isn't this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence? By my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the most high is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the, drew, with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Verse 34. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High 
I honored and glorified him who lives forever. I want to ask you this one question this morning. As we read, as we think about what is going on in this passage, I want to ask you this. Where are you looking? Where are you looking? And in this situation, in this scenario, you can only look in two, two places. You're either looking at yourself or you're looking up. And what happens when we look at ourself? When we look at ourself, when we look at who we are, what we do, and when we start to put our satisfaction and our contentment and our, and our identity in what we do and how we do it and how well we, we do things, our satisfaction is temporary. Our contentment is temporary. Because here's the thing. If you put all of, all of your tokens, all your money on the good stuff that you do, if you put your identity on the good things that you do, you're going to have to put your identity in the failures also. You're going to put your contentment in your failures. Your emotions, your joy is going to be strung and matched with how awful we do. And whenever that happens, we're not going to be content. <laughs> we're going to be messed up. Our emotion our satisfaction, our joy will be temporary if ever we identify with our successes because we're going to identify with the failures. But what happens when we look up? Daniel 4, 34, we just read it. It says this, at the, time, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. Guys, when we look up, we give God the honor and the glory that he deserves. When we look up, we find where our help comes from. When we look up, we find our sanity. Because, guys, life is crazy. Life throws you questions and curveballs that you might not know the answers to. It might throw you in a loop, and you might actually go crazy. But when we look up, we find our sanity. We find our hope. We found our satisfaction. And guys, we realize that the good that we are, that the good we do, is only because of the grace of God. If we look up, and when we look up, we realize, look at me, that we are a broken people in need of a Savior. But it, it doesn't just stop there. We're in need of a Savior who's been broken for us so that we don't have to stay broken. Guys, God is inviting us. He's encouraging us to look up. That's where our help comes from.